I have prepared a little talk called The Novel and the Museum. When I moved to university in the autumn of 1998, the museum was our entire horizon, literally an imposing stone edifice occupying an entire city block, three stories tall. The Royal Ontario Museum was directly across the road from our residents and all girls residents at the University of Toronto. And every night the sun went down behind it a little earlier than it might have if we'd had a less magnificent neighbor. Now, all of this sounds really impressive, but I regretfully and most unimpressively have no recollection of ever having gone to the ROM during those years when I lived so nearby. The closest we ever came was a Toronto Film Festival gala. We went across the street to get a glimpse of Denzel Washington while dressed in our pajamas. I used to walk through the loading dock on the south side to get to my literature for our time classes at Trinity College three days a week. I worked at Pizza Hut on Bloor Street on the north side, selling not very fresh slices in the takeout window across the street from what is now the Crystal. But what was then the ROM's Queen Elizabeth Terrace Galleries, which opened in 1984 and were demolished barely 20 years later. The Pizza Hut is gone now too. The entire block transformed. There's no more Swiss Chalet, Bedford Ballroom, or country style donuts. I used to think that cities were like mountains, solid, stone, unmovable, but it turns out that they are as ephemeral as anything. What lasts is one of the preoccupations, that question of asking for a friend, and also a question whose answers I've been wrong about again and again throughout my life. In terms of relationships, fads and fashions, the idea of wearing tapered jeans during those years when I lived across the road from the ROM would have appalled me, for example. Or that in my third year of university, I would move into an apartment with a friend who I was absolutely besotted with, one of the best people I'd ever known. And if you would tell me that, if you had told me that there would come a time 22 years later when I didn't even talk to her, I wouldn't have believed you. And all the while, my children are listening to ABBA. So what I mean is, how can a person ever tell what comes down through the years? In my fourth and final year of university, I moved into an apartment off campus at Dundas and Bathurst, an apartment that you have been introduced to if you've read my book. And I'm quoting a place up a narrow flight of stairs above a Chinese herb shop where there wasn't an actual hearth. The closest thing was an old electric oven where only two of the stove elements functioned and the oven handle kept falling off. But the kitchen always felt warm with the window facing south so the light was usually golden. I still drive by there twice a week when I'm picking up my children from Girl Guides. And this is how it is when you've lived in a city for 25 years. Am I haunting the places I used to know or are those places haunting me? It's a weird thing to raise your children around the same neighborhoods where you spent your formative and perhaps most nonsensical years to push a stroller along that very same block where I once worked at Pizza Hut, which is all brand new condos now. On my way to the museum, that was once my horizon, but I have a membership these days and we head inside, exploring hands-on galleries and dinosaur bones. My children are so familiar with the ROM that it's almost their horizon too, if not literally. And it was within the bowels of that building where the first spark of asking for a friend was lit, which I'd forgotten about totally. Every time Jess was pregnant, Clara had been the first to know, is the first sentence of my novel. And it's what I've been telling everybody since the book came out, how it's always been 
the first sentence. The novel beginning with two friends connecting for the very first time all together serendipitously on a Saturday night in December 1998 in a university residence as snow falls outside and the museum across the road is lit up for a gala. But that isn't true at all because before I ever wrote that sentence, I'd written about Pompeii, inspired by the In the Shadow of the Volcano exhibit I took my kids to at the ROM in the summer of 2015. I think I wrote about the strangeness of taking my children to that exhibit, about the eeriness of so much life preserved and also so much devastation and so much death. The moral of the story might be that Asking for a Friend was a novel born of my anxiety. I don't remember if Jess and Clara were together in the scene or how much either of them existed as characters yet, nor do I have any way of finding out what was in those pages, though I remember being fond of them because somehow or another, the whole thing got lost. Not even from me pouring tea on my laptop because I checked my blog and that happened the following year. So I don't know, most likely I saved the file on my desktop and then trashed it by mistake. What lasts? That question. Luckily, I hadn't got very far into the document, maybe a couple of thousand words or so. I had to open up the new file and start writing again. These days, I am a passionate user of Dropbox. So my novel is fiction. Its characters' stories are less rooted in autobiog autobiography than any other novel that I've written. My previous novel, Waiting for a Star to Fall, was about a young woman having a passionate secret affair with a charismatic hotshot politician. And fortunately, I have never been in that situation. But I was able to tap into angsty memories of, of unrequited love from those university days, um, from my own experiences to, to get to what my character was feeling. With this novel though, people have said, are you a Jess or are you a Clara? But I think I could probably ask any of you the same thing. It would be just as relevant. I was definitely not present in that common room on the wintry night when the two of them met. I was probably out accosting poor Denzel in my pajamas. <laughs> my novel is fiction, but it's a kind of museum too. An archive of a particular place in time. My own history preserved in amber, even if I don't appear as a character. From the book, everybody was dressed in the same vintage uniform. Flared jeans with soggy hems, secondhand suede and leather jackets and that smell of wet coats mixed with cigarettes. Would for Jess ever after be a time machine? I wanted to write about that. I wanted to write about being sad all the time when I was 20 and listening to Natalie and Brulia on repeat and big shiny tunes too and mbop and boys in bucket hats and bad campus theater and how subversive it felt to drag our mattresses outside like the whole world was our bedroom. I wanted to write about what it felt to be coming into adulthood against the backdrop of 9-11 the way we used to have to go to the library to check our email. And then one day we got internet access at our excruciatingly boring post-grad jobs and how it brought the world to us. I really did, like the character in my book, have a job stuffing envelopes at a driving school. And on the second day I showed up and nobody could believe it. I wanted to write about how it felt to be under the sky and convinced that you're the center of the universe. And I don't know if that's a thing people feel in the early 20s or if it was just being pre-social media before we walked around with this device in our pockets that was telling us that everybody's out there having fun without us. In 2011, a decade after we lived there, our apartment in Dundas and Bathurst, which was also Jess and Clara's apartment, the one where the squirrels got in through the ceiling, although in our case, it was actually a raccoon it came in through a broken window screen and I can't remember how we got it out. But our apartment was literally turned into a museum. It was supposed to represent a typical Toronto apartment. I still can't believe this really happened. And when I was putting this together a couple of days ago, I had to go back and find the blog TO article just to confirm that I hadn't made it up. 
at the time in 2011, there was a design studio that was downstairs in the building. And they'd taken over the apartment upstairs to show their work in a home setting. So there were sculptures and furniture and gorgeous light fixtures. But the ugly linoleum was exactly the same. And the ancient appliances hadn't been replaced. It was the weirdest thing, but also bizarrely fitting that this place where I'd spent some of the most consequential time of my life had been preserved in this way, that I could have taken a tour Although I've only found out about it after, so I missed the opportunity. But maybe that's for the best because, as they say, you can't go home again. And it wouldn't have been the same. Nothing we owned in that apartment was even nice, let alone designed. And so it just would have been really confusing. I would have been looking for the creaky oak table and a candle stuck in a wine bottle at its center with the wax dripping down the sides of it. So I put it all in my book instead a book that's dedicated to the friends who lived with me there and also to my best friends from high school. All these women who know things about me that nobody else does or ever will. Each of them an archive of our stories, all the things we've shared together. These are friendships that have survived inexplicably, sometimes miraculously, when so many others didn't. All Jess ever wanted, in addition to everything was to know that she and Clara would always be friends. What lasts? What survives? These are questions that both the characters in my book investigate in their professional work. Clara does archeological field work unearthing fragments from ancient hearthstones. Jess becomes a scholar of folk and fairy tales, each of them finding in their work what they're attracted to in each other. Clara for Jess is a source of spirit and light Jess provides Clara with roots and a sense of belonging. And at that particular moment that connects them on that evening in 1998 and in the weeks and months to follow, each is precisely what the other requires. And they become home to each other, which would make for a very, the, the very best kind of happily ever after. Except there really is no such thing. In stories, maybe in fairy tales, but not for real living things like city blocks and human beings and actual relationships, which are as dynamic and ever changing as nature itself. What are the odds of any relationship making it, let alone friendships, which lack the cultural ritual scripts and guidelines with which we navigate romantic marital relationships? And yet so many relationships, friendships do survive. People finding ways to continue to connect over decades across huge distances through tumultuous life changes and other challenges. I still find it mind blowing that I met my two best friends from high school when we were 13 years old, an age at which I was wrong about almost everything. <laughs> but somehow I got that one thing right that these would be my people. And I don't know if anything has ever been more consequential, a more consequential choice I made than that, or at least not at that point. I don't know who I would be without them, but it wasn't easy. And that's also something I wanna capture in my novel about how, how hard it can be to become oneself in the company of others, to be navigating the particularly shifty grounds, shifty and shifting, <laughs> of one's 20s and 30s, when every choice seems to have such stakes, where everybody else's choices can seem to be a reflection or more accurately, a projection of your own. Being happy at your best friend's wedding when you might be brokenhearted, celebrating your pregnancy when you know your friend isn't sure she's ever going to have the baby she longs for. Of course, we want the best things for our friends, but it can be an aching thing to be toasting their successes when we're not sure of the paths we're on ourselves. And even when the paths are parallel, well, that can only make our friends' choices seem more of a reflection of our own. And how do we ever know if we're doing it right? I think it takes a certain kind of magnanimousness, generosity, strength of character to make through all these life transitions without a little bit of tension 
And when I was 25 or 30, I didn't possess any of those qualities in abundance yet. It got easier, though, and I don't remember if anyone told me that, that everything wouldn't always seem so fraught, that I'd come into my own, and so would my friends, and I would just admire them and be able to respect the ways that were different and be grateful for the ways that were the same. I am right in the middle of my 40s now, and I don't think my friendships have ever been less complicated, which is good because life in general always is and I have my friends to lean on together we celebrate our wins and also our struggles and I don't understand the mathematics of it how goodness shared is multiplied and sharing the hard bits makes the load so much lighter which is why I love the ending of the novel the way that Jess and Clara are floating and I don't think this is a spoiler I think you'll be fine the idea of that ease between them for the first time in a long time. And I like to think that this is their happily ever after. Not that their story is over, but it will go on like this, that they will have found their rhythm, their flow, their stride, that their friendship really will turn out to be one of the great loves of their life. Maybe the great love. Each friend is finally comfortable with her own self, which makes it that much easier to be comfortable with each other, to be at home with each other again in that miraculous way they were when they first found each other. Which brings me back to the museum, to 1998, to that building we never went inside because you needed money for that. And also we were very busy watching TLC daytime. But it was always there, like a great stone giant asleep across the road, as sprawling in geography as it was as a cultural force, as a gatekeeper, an arbiter of whose stories are worth telling. And really, I'm talking about the museum as an idea now. And certainly, there has been huge progress in the last 25 years in terms of thinking about what kind of stories matter, but it's hardly enough because was it yesterday or 94 years ago that Virginia Woolf wrote in a room of one's own, but it is obvious that the values of women differ very often from the values which have been made by the other sex. Naturally, this is so, yet it is the masculine values that prevail. Speaking crudely, football and sport are important. The worship of fashion, the buying of clothes, trivial, and these values are inevitably transferred from life to fiction. This is an important book, the critic assumes, because it deals with war. This is an insignificant book because it deals with the feelings of women in a drawing room. A scene in a battlefield is more important than a scene in a shop. Everywhere and much more subtly, the difference of value persists. The feelings of women in a drawing room, in a common room, in a kitchen, a stairwell, a bedroom, sitting around tables, lying on beds, putting the kettle on over and over and over again. Women who are talking to each other and not even just about their relationships with men. In 1998, just like Jess, I had no idea that I was living blocks away from the address where an abortion clinic had been firebombed just six years before. I didn't know that my own reproductive freedom was the result of a battle that had been won just a decade before that in 1988. Why did it take me so long to learn that it was a Canadian Union of Postal Workers strike in 1981 that helped win paid maternity leave across Canada? All these ideas that have played a huge role in my character's life and in my life. Where were the museum exhibits? about any of this. This is an important book, which is a very subversive thing to say about a novel whose spine is pink, a novel with women wearing bathing suits on the cover, two women who look happy, even. Women don't always get to be happy, each with an arm around each other's shoulder and the other arm in the air, like they're belting out the lyrics to a song they know by heart, the way they've come to know each other by heart. This is a story about friends where no one has to die at the end. Not yet, 
at least. This is an important book because women's stories matter. Women's lives in relationship to each other too. But for too long, stories like that and the ideas that inform them have been lost to history, absent from archives, missing from the museum. The Feelings of Women in a Drawing Room. That's a book I want to read. And this is the book I wanted to write, a novel that captures a sense of the time I never thought of as a particular one while we were living it. But it's clear in retrospect, which I'm beginning to realize now is always the way with history. Thank you. And look, I did it. I shared it and I that was stopped fantastic. sharing it. Oh. <laughs> that was fantastic. Congratulations. That was very, very informative. So thank you. Thank so, you. Um, I guess now we'll get into our little bit of a discussion. I don't I hope that, I don't know how long that took you to put together, but that was brilliant. Just tying it all all together, start to finish. So since you sort of uh, you ended with the cover, I'm going to start with the cover. So um, how much input did you have as an author into the cover of the book? None, which is oh. good because I don't know anything about covers. But I guess they you know what they sent me two covers and they were both nice and um you know and they could have asked for my input before but I there thankfully there are people who do that for a living and uh, her name was Lisa Jagger with the design team at Penguin Random House and she did a beautiful job and so it was this cover or one that was kind of sad it was it was gray uh, it was a foggy day and they were I think on like a raft so it, the swimming element was there which I liked but I just loved the sunset I am obsessed with you know this I, I love the sky I love how it's different every day and so uh it was really beautiful that it that it captured that spirit and so yeah the cover I'm so happy with as well as the pink spine the pink spine is so cute yes it certainly is so and then going on with you talking about the swimming you are you are a lovely you love to swim was that something you wanted to incorporate into the book um, at the very beginning when you were writing this or? It was entirely by accident. They just okay. kept leaping into bodies of water. Um, not at the very beginning, which is interesting because um, when I went, when I lived in University of Toronto in my undergrad, we never went to the lake. It seems so far away. Um, but I mean, now I go there as often as I can so yeah that once they sort of found out there was once every time there were bodies of water nearby they leapt in I could they couldn't help themselves good thank you um so it's funny a couple of people came up with this how did the, you come up with the title because it's almost got a double entendre asking for a friend and asking for, you know asking for like you're looking for a friend but yeah. you're also making an inquiry on behalf of a friend so how did you how how did you come up with that title? Was it in intention to be a double entendre? Yeah, or? I love the title. It was always the title. I didn't ever have a different one. Uh, I know that there are a number of of other books that have the same title, so that was the only pushback that I was wondering if I'd get. But it was always the title. Um, yeah, I liked it because it's about people who are looking for friends, looking for connection. But what I really love about the double meaning is when people say, um, you know, such and such asking for a friend, often they're not, right? That's often a joke or or something if you don't really want to show all your cards and, and reveal your own situation. So it, you're asking for a friend. Um, and I mean, sometimes maybe you are actually asking for a friend, but I have found that when people are asking for a friend, they're often telling on themselves in a little bit of, of a way, like maybe maybe it's not for a friend at all. Um, and sometimes when we think we're asking for our friends, and, and I think I show this in the novel too, it's very much um, one friend being very concerned with their own self, right? The concern that, that Jess has for Clara in the book is often just the fact that Clara is so different and Jess's concern is born out of anxiety, which is your path is different than mine. What if mine isn't the right one? And um, yeah, just just seeing the different trajectories a friend's life can take um, can be difficult and it's difficult for my character. So yeah, I think when we're asking for a friend, we're often telling on ourselves and I think that's interesting. So um, another question that came is, um, Clara strikes the reader as being a go-getter, whereas Jess comes across as a bit passive. 
is their friendship a case of opposites attract or is there something deeper going on? Does Clara need to mother someone in the case of Jess to feel complete? Yeah, that I think that they are. What's interesting about their characters, I think, is that they change throughout the book. And so at the very beginning, well, the, the fundamental parts of their characters don't change, but their relationship to each other and their dynamic and their connection does. So in the beginning, yeah, Clara is so worldly and Jess is naive and Clara like finds Jess when she is lost and um but but it shifts a little bit and and I think they get uncomfortable with the shift when when Jess starts sort of finding out what her own thing is um and and then she has a child and Clara hasn't had a baby and she uh, there's a line about her being she doesn't want to sit at Jess's feet she's uncomfortable with the with the reversal of their dynamic um so I think it is opposites attract um and and that keeps their dynamic uh complicated and and yeah because it's ever shifting too and if you're used to being the one who is uh the leader and the one who sort of knows more and has the wisdom and, and then things change um that that can be kind of discombobulating and I think I think Clara finds that and I think Jess also resents always being the one who's running behind and so that's just a dynamic they have to work on throughout their relationship um now you write the female characters very, very well. How do you like writing male characters? Because certainly your male, your male characters in, in this book are obviously, they're very, they're loosely, you don't go into a lot of depth with them. They're sort of, you, as a reader, or as a, when I was reading it, it was just like, okay, yeah, you know, these guys are, no, I shouldn't say insignificant, but they're such, they, Jess and Clara have such strong personalities. Did you on purpose make the men sort of more subdued, like Nick and Adam, were they, was that a, yeah, did there's you a kind of do that reasons. on purpose because you really wanted to highlight the, the strength of the female characters? I know you just. Yeah, so there's a few things. Um, I did a book club last week and this is where I said this the first time. If you think the characters in this novel aren't fully developed, like you should read my other novels. I've come a really long way. Um, I'm very, very interested in women's lives and women's characters. And um, and so learning to write interesting men has been a challenge of mine. And again, I think I've I've done a good job um giving these people um like they're they're they're, they're more they're the most well well-rounded men I've ever written. Um, but I think purposely I wanted to keep them sort of on the down low I wanted the women's personalities to take up the space in the room um, I also I, don't, I, I also wanted to give the women um, fairly uncomplicated relationships I mean there are complications and you know we, we don't see everything that's going on but um, I wanted to make their relationships uncomplicated to just be able to really explore the friendship um, and I think also having like kind of steady uncomplicated partners allow these women to fully explore the the depths of of their connection to each other and I also just I know a lot of people who married nice men and so um you know it's a little bit like life in that way I guess not everything needs to be fraught no very good that's a great answer thank you um how much of this was written during the pandemic I wrote this before the pandemic. I wrote this book before um, my second novel, um, Waiting for a Star to Fall. I had written this, I started writing this book in 2015 after I had found um, a publishing contract for my first book, Mitzi Bites. And while I was waiting for edits to come back, I started writing this book. And you know, I'd been to the Pompeii exhibit as I'd told you and I remember sitting in a cafe with my friend once my youngest child had gone to preschool and writing about Clara's room and I remember sort of like the inventory of all the stuff that was in there that allowed me to build that world and know who she was as a character so I wrote all of this sort of off and on um, around Mitzi Bites um, and then I submitted it to be published and my novel was rejected and so but I had written my other novel waiting for a star to fall and thankfully that book got picked up and and this one too so this is actually my second book but I also think I just needed 
lots of time to work on it because the canvas is so much larger. I wrote um, Waiting for a Star to Fall, the first draft in a few months. And this book, yeah, this book took me years off and on. And it took me a lot of learning and growing. And the, the canvas is just so much larger than my other books. And so that makes sense. And then during the pandemic, the, that's when the book got its contract. And I started really editing it and drilling down. And um, that was a heady time. And I think I was really... I don't know, able to to tap into complicated emotions. And, and I, I think I alluded to sort of a novel born out of anxiety. And, and that definitely plays a role in the book. I know a lot of authors have written, uh, you know, there was, it was a prolific time for some authors to really churn out a whole bunch of stuff. And I thought, you know, it's you ha we all had a lot more time on our hands during the pandemic. So I just thought you revisiting all your friendship and you pu putting that into the into the story but it was more I think it would have been a different kind of book I think I, I don't think I could have written this during the pandemic there's a real expansiveness to it that I don't think I could have tapped into at that time and it conveniently ends in 2018 and I have a fantasy that um Jess invited Clara and her family to stay at their very large um, house by the lake during lockdown and they all got along well because there certainly was enough room <laughs> there you go um, the book fried green tomatoes at the whistle stop cafe appears at the beginning and the end of your story why was the book important is it important an important book to you or why did you want to incorporate it into the story yeah so there were lots of really great books and movies about women's friendship in the 1990s that I was just sort of eating up and it was especially southern stories um it was you know designing women was on tv and the golden girls and and fried green tomatoes and and um steel magnolias like all these stories that I really loved and um I wanted to play homage to a friendship book so I also talk about summer sisters by Judy Bloom and the divine secrets of the yaya sisterhood which we were all reading in like 1998 in my university residence, I recall. So I wanted to to like, yeah, play, pay tribute to that a little bit. Um, I reread Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe last year, and I regret that I did not love it as much as I once did. But then I rewatched the movie and it was amazing. It was, I, it definitely held up. And the Kathy Bates, Jessica Tandy story is I wouldn't have maybe paid attention to that when I was like 11 watching it, but I loved it, except that I'm older than Kathy Bates was in Fried Green Tomatoes, which I'm having an existential crisis about. Um, but it's such a good movie. So, yeah, I, I really wanted to play tribute to the female friendship canon for sure. There you go. So, so since we just sort of diverted off into movies, is there a have you been option for a possible putting this into a mini series? I think it would. No make one's it... called yet, but if anyone knows anybody, please. <laughs> please reach I think out. it would make a great series on TV. So, oh, me you too. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Um, pregnancy is a very important topic and theme that runs throughout the book. So not wanting to be pregnant, wanting to be pregnant, desperately wanting to be pregnant, normal pregnancy, complicated pregnancies. Um, pregnancy has obviously been a pretty, an, an interest to you. Um, and um, I guess there, I mean, there's, they, it's sort of in and out of books, a lot of books, but th this was definitely a focus or a, a theme that runs throughout the, the books. Um, like, can you I can talk about that. Explain why, yeah, I was going to say, can you sort of explain why you really wanted to delve into, particularly into the pregnancies of these two women and the, the traumas, the highs and the lows? Yeah. So I think one thing I have been obsessed with since I started publishing books is the way that women's different experiences um, of having children or not having them or just like what it is to be a person with a uterus and what you happen to do with it by choice or not, um, it, it can make things really hard and there's a story about how women's lives are supposed to go and few people's lives you know go according to script and so my very first book I published an anthology of essays in 2013 that was all about women's different experiences and it was born from a friend of mine who was desperately trying to have a baby when you know I I had mine and and she was so struggling and heartbroken and it struck me that her experience was such an a common one with women she felt so outside of ordinary and outside of womanhood womanhood and but I mean it's such a common thing and and I just felt like 
putting all those stories together in a book of women who have children who don't, um, women who maybe had them when they didn't want to, women who adopted. So anyway, they're all in the anthology and they're mixed up. And it's sort of the tension and the connections between people's different experiences um, has just always fascinated me. And so this is the case in the novel too. I think um, the different ways our lives go in terms of reproduction um, can make friendships. Um, it brings Clara and Jess together at the very beginning of the book. Um, and and I think, you know, people end up like I had friends who were pregnant around the same time as me and and it was a really great connection, but it could also be really hard. And, um, you know, then it gets difficult when Jess is pregnant and Clara wants to be. It is fraught. It's tense. And I think it's it's that same thing I'd already mentioned about how difficult it is to live your life and see a person living a different life and and like sort of making sense of of the distance between you and so i i just i'm so interested in the way women's stories rub up against each other and i wanted to show that in this book well this is a perfect segue into the next question so on page 152 jess said the worst thing about having children is that the list of terrible possibilities is endless this felt entirely true to me, and um, that was from the writer, but also me as the, the one delivering the question. I completely agree with that. But Jess and Clara were at different stages of motherhood, so they couldn't always understand what the other needed. So how might they have given each other that support? Like, uh, do you have an answer to, to that? I think some of it is is getting outside of, of those terribly urgent um early days when everything feels like a crisis um there's a point where um I think Clara has her baby and Jess knows that her hormones are going to go fluey at, at a certain point and she doesn't say anything at all and that is like like Jess like that's a big she's just said I'm not I'm just gonna let it happen and I think that's the thing once once you realize that your advice isn't really asked for or applicable necessarily and just you have the confidence enough to in yourself and, and your friend to know that they're going to have to make their own way. Um, it, it gets a little bit easier to give the people the space they need and not to always be projecting your own stuff onto what everyone else is going through. Jess struggled a lot when she had a baby. And so she was just expecting Clara's experience to be a mirror image of that. And when it wasn't, she was super confused. And then for me, I, I had similar experiences. And then all of a sudden I realized, oh, like people are different. And <laughs> who knew? Um, and, and maybe that's growing up. And, um, you know, I talked about friendships being easier now. And I think learning that, that, that you have to let people find their own way. Um, just so, yeah, just the distance. I think you have to go through it, though. You have to make mistakes before you learn how to do it right. <laughs> yeah. And it's trial with children. It's trial by error as well because you just don't know what you're getting in a in the little the little bundle of joy. You know they they've all got different personalities, so it's yes. the, it's the managing the managing of that as well. So, um, another question that came in is the scabies versus autism debate on page one fifty one and one fifty two a real thing? I think I was exaggerating. Okay, uh, a little bit, yeah. But I mean that there is well, I mean we've been through this was before the pandemic but you know we know that that people's instincts about protecting children and all of that can um and also my kids went to a co-op preschool so sometimes there was you know people who had very strong feelings about like about not actually the not washing things with bleach did it did come up but thankfully no one ever got scabies so yeah I think I was just sort of um <laughs> exaggerating a bit of hyperbole there you go. Now, are you an anxious mother? I know you've got two daughters. Um, no, 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 no. I just, I mean, I think a lot of parents are, but it, the anxieties that came through in the book, I so thought they sure. were very real. Like they felt really, really real. Like the emotions were real there and the anxiety. So I just wondered. So I was really proud of the way that I had written Jess's experience with anxiety. Um, and Look, I remember reading the article in the newspaper about the children locked in cars and I don't even have a car. So like, that's like the one thing I didn't get that anxious about. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I felt like, you know, I, I'm really nailing this character's anxiety. Um, and then about a year before my two years. So about two years ago, um, I realized that 
I had terrible anxiety and I was like, oh. So I wasn't like being this this literary genius conjuring this character. It was definitely my own anxiety. And it's really funny to go back and read it and, and be like, Carrie, you were not okay. And maybe you should have seen that coming. Um, and I even, you know, I Jess is diagnosed with um, postpartum anxiety. And um, yeah, I, I sort of like wrapped up her her experience and put a little bow on it and then then yeah I realized that it, it was a projection of my own experiences all along and so yeah that was totally interesting it's interesting how writing a book can be a way of expressing all my neuroses without me even knowing it <laughs> and hopefully it was therapeutic in the process so it absolutely was actually and another fun question that came in um the scene where the um, um uh, was it Jess or Clara falls asleep in the dentist chair and the person that wrote in said that also happened to them so they wanted to know if it actually did happen to you as well so I can't remember which character it was I think it might have been it totally happened to me and I remember also going to get my Thank eyebrows you. waxed because you just <laughs> I got to lay down and it was like the greatest and yeah that's really sad now that I look back at it and I'm glad those days are gone I get you know other opportunities to to lie down and take care of myself now other than like being poked in the teeth and the head there you go. good well I know we're getting close to the end um there are still a few other questions to go so I'm just going to have a quick look at to see which one I think is the most relevant to end on um mm, 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 mm. sort of touched on all of those and I guess uh, one final one um Oh boy, <laughs> I think you've covered off most of them in what we've been talking about. So I'm gonna do a typical question that, um, you know, authors hate to have, but are you working on something else? <laughs> I have, I, I'm happy to have you ask any question you wanna ask, Sarah. Um, I have written a novel, I wanted to do something fun in the pandemic. And I really love the novelist Barbara Pym um, as a church, book group you absolutely should read Barbara Pym she has a whole novel called Excellent Women that is all about the people who make things happen in a church community I love Barbara Pym's books and so I wanted she, she wrote in the 1950s to the 1970s and I wanted to write a Barbara Pym book set in now um, but also sort of inspired by Catherine Heine's books Catherine Heine have you read her Sarah I have yeah oh I love her so I wanted to write a Barbara Pym slash Catherine Heine-ish novel. So I wrote about this woman whose marriage blows up and she moves into a bed sit and tries to become an excellent woman and she becomes a book indexer and and um, wacky things ensue and it's quite fun. And so that's what I'm working on. I need there, to figure out the ending. There you go. So I, can I ask, I'm just going to interject. There was a big book that came out, The Letters of, of Miss Pym or something or another that came out. It was nonfiction. It was it was her biography That's and right. it was incredible it was so, so you have been using that as for some of your research oh then. I read that as soon as yeah. I'm in I'm in the Barbara Pym Society I get the Green Leaves newsletter twice a year wow. um <laughs> I, I love Barbara Pym and so yeah I wanted I wanted to bring her sensibility to the 2020s because I think we need a bit of excellence Yes, I would agree there. So that's a perfect way to to end. So I'm going to pass this over to I know because you've got young ladies you have to get from Girl Guides. I, I have to you. drive by my old apartment again. You know, you did so <laughs> there. You <laughs> go and have a have a look at it. So yeah. I guess you'll never get away from it, which is which is great. Anyway, so I'm going to pass it over to Maya and she's going to do our little conclusion. But thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on on a on a Tuesday evening to tell us about your book. It's absolutely fabulous. And like it's I said, such a it, pleasure. It made me revisit my one I've got a very one very very special friendship I met her in kindergarten and we are still best friends and it's just there were certain passages in the book that just tugged at my heart and thought all the ups and downs that we've had and you know it is nice to have those special friendships but it's nice to see it sort of put into a book and it makes you take note for your own friendships so thank, thank you very you. much for joining us and for writing this such such a special book thank you so much well, Carrie, 
I'm pretty sure we are the same age. So I loved when you were putting up those pictures just of Lilith, just of moments in my life um, in my 20s. Um, and I guess the just the privilege to come close to the stories of your life and how you have woven them into the stories of these two women and encouraged us tonight to really be thinking about the women in our lives and who we are in the world. So I just want to bless you um, out of the stroller days into this next chapter of, of where you're writing. But I just want to give thanks for the way your words have not only landed on Sarah's heart and in our lives, but in what will be next for you and continue to be excited about people who have gone before. And we're just looking forward to how you'll be one of those people that people look up to. So um, have this blessing carry you into the next season of writing from our house to yours.